have Professor Shoykat Majumda talk about the craft of fiction. So a bit detail about the topic. Is fiction unreal? Does it have to be invented? What is the place of the real in fiction? Where does reality end and the fiction and the fictional begin? Does fiction involve telling a story? Is it possible to have fiction without a story? What is the relation between the modern literary genres of the novel and the short story with ancient forms of storytelling? Is it possible to learn to write? In a classroom, is it teachable? Is it like the technical art forms, filmmaking, sculpture, photography? How important are technicalities in literature? If life and language are all we need, is our everyday life the best classroom for creative writers? What place does creative writing have next to other university subjects, literature, history, sociology, the sciences, the performing arts? So after his lecture, he will also be sharing some more information and very integral information about the master's in English program at Ashoka University. The admissions process, the timeline, financial aid offered, and the prospects of learning the master's in English at Ashoka. The last 20 minutes of the session will be dedicated to clarifying all your doubts and answering your questions. Please feel free to share your questions in the question answer tab or the chat box as per your convenience. Before I hand over to Professor, I would like to take this opportunity to introduce him to you, though he really needs no introduction. Um, so Professor Shoykat Mojumdar is a professor of English and creative writing at Ashoka University. He has taught previously at Stanford University and was a fellow at the Newhouse Center for Humanities at Wellesley College. He's the author of Prose of the World, Modernism and the Banality of Empire, a study of modern world literature in English. College 2018, a general nonfiction on liberal arts education in India and the co-editor with Arthi Vade of a collection of essays, The, Critical, the Critique as Amateur in 2019. Shoykot has published three novels, most recently, The Scent of God, a finalist for the Matrabhumi Book of the Year Award 2020, and a one of the Times of India's 20 most talked about Indian books of 2019. The Firebird, published as Playhouse in the US, one of the Telegraph's best books of 2015, and a finalist at the Bangalore Literature Festival, Fiction Prize, and the Mumbai Film Festival, What to Screen Market, and Silverfish, 2007. Shoykot is a columnist for Outlook and Los Angeles Review of Books and writes for the Hindu, Telegraph, Times Higher Education, Hindustan Times, Indian Express, Scroll, Wire, LitHub, and other venues. His work has appeared in major journals and collections, including PMLA, NLH, New Literary History, Cambridge History of the Indian Novel in English, Cambridge Companion to the Essay, Cambridge History of the Br British Essay, Modern Fiction Studies and Literary Activism, a collection of perspectives edited by Amit Chaudhary. Shoykot's new novel, The Middle Finger, will be published in January 2022. Over to you, Professor. Okay, thank you, Anuja, and um, thank you all for being here. And apologies for imposing that rather <laughs> cumbersome bio. We should have been a little more streamlined and efficient about it because we are here to talk about more exciting things than you know my life story. But um, but uh, anyway, thank thank you for being here. I mean, I know um, it's a um, it's a Sunday morning, so for taking time. Um, I want to talk about uh, creative writing and the program, and I think it's um, an especially interesting subject because it's a very new thing. You know, what is creative writing? What is that we are doing? It's been around in America for a long time. Um, you know, it's kind of catching up in some other Western countries, but in India, of course, where there's a distinguished literary tradition, it's a uh, it's still a very new thing, and and there are a lot of skepticisms whether we can do it. Um, so let me start by saying right at the outset, um, you know, um, that uh, creative writing cannot be taught, you know, in, in its real thing, the thing that really matters, the, there's something wild about writing, that, that part cannot be taught, because writing is a lot like life, it's really 
um, it, it happens everywhere. You, you can't really concentrate kind of slice out. And there was this wonderful um, kind of funny story Richard Feynman used to say about the Manhattan Project that it was obviously um, making of the atom bomb and it was manned by the, um, you know, so the military personnel of the US. And one day they came up to Feynman and asked that, you know, everybody uh, logs in their hours of work, our army, the military people, your scientists are the only ones who don't log their hours. And Feynman said, you see, the problem is um, my scientists often get their best ideas while they're sleeping in their dreams. You know? <laughs> and how can you log your hours? So that says a lot about writing that you can't really, um, you know, kind of, um, kind of contain it. Now, that being said, I think, you know, this is um, one, one really important thing a creative writing classroom or whether you call it a classroom or a studio, does it that it creates a community. It does create a community. And this is those of you who had a chance to uh, read the Hindu essay I shared um, on uh, loving and hating creative writing workshops. I tried to sort of lay it out there what can be achieved in a creative writing studio, what are the problems, what can we learn. Uh, so, one very important thing, you know, writing is very isolating, it's very personal. You know, it's not like a play. It's not like, you know, doing a film or starting a band. It's very individual. It's very, it's very lonely. So it's very important for writers to come together, writers to come together and talk about their experience, share writing. So I always tell my students that the really important part of a creative writing class is not the writing itself. That you'll do it anyway. The really important part of the creative writing class is the reading. And of course, by reading, I mean both reading, say, published work, which might give you a sense of direction, that, that things that can, can be done in writing, but also the work in progress shared by your peers. This is extremely important. So when you read somebody's draft, somebody's work in progress, you're giving them feedback, you're helping them, but you're also very crucially helping yourself. See, writing cannot really be taught. What can be taught is editing. So writers often have this kind of magnet or their fridge, like write drunk, edit sober. You know, it's a bit of a joke, but it's, it's a, it, there's some truth in that. Writing happens in a really spontaneous way, but editing happens in a much more rational and sober way. And that is one thing that is teachable. How do you recognize a good sentence? How do you recognize a bad sentence? Now that is something. So at the end of a semester, I'm actually teaching a course called the craft of fiction right now. I mean, it, the entire sem spring semester. So the thing is that at the end of it, we can be reasonably confident. We can give you a sense of how to read your own writing. So a good writer has to be a good editor of their own work. Of course, if, if they're good editors of other people's work, that's a great skill too, but you need to identify yourself. So the thing is, I think when it comes to any art form, the technicalities can be taught, right? Um, and I personally feel um, literature is the least technical of all art forms and people might disagree with me here um like i think filmmaking is the most technical of all, all art forms simply because there's a lot of engineering involved there's a lot of science involved there's a lot of really very technical of course all art forms have a scientific part and all art forms have an artistic part the scientific part is the only part you can teach the artistic part you can cultivate and nourish but it cannot really be taught uh, so i think literature is the least technical because we use a medium which we all use language and within literature I think poetry is more technical than prose again this is my personal opinion I'm not a poet I'm a prose and fiction writer but I think prose is the language of everyday life and it's actually the less technical I always um, you know like to say that there are really two things you need to be a writer you know uh, just two things um, just make it very simple uh, one is you need an interesting relationship with life right? Mind you, not an interesting life. There's no such thing as an interesting life because there's no such thing as an uninteresting life. All life is interesting. You know, uh, never one of the mistakes people make is that, oh, I must have these experiences to be able to write. I must travel. I must do that. All that is good. All that is good for you as a human being, but you can't go around life with a diary. You can't go around life with, with a notebook. I'm going to note things so that I can learn, I can get, you know, art is always where you are. Don't go anywhere looking for art. The very act of trying to look for art will mess everything up. It will mess up your life. 
it will mess up your art. I mean, art is, I like to say, um, it's like that uh, darkness inside a refrigerator. You know, it's always dark inside the fridge, but the moment you open it, the light comes on. So the very act of looking, there's a, I think there's a term in physics for it that, you know, kind of looking at a subject changes it. So there's a glorious carelessness about art. There's a glorious and unselfconscious around art, which you cannot mess with. So this approach of living like a writer, you know, it's like I must um, go there and live a certain kind of a lifestyle, drink a lot, sleep with multiple people, you know, wear black, look very gothic. All of these are kind of propaganda. It's And there's a reason why this propaganda happened. But basically, you don't need to do change anything. You just need to look at your life in a different way. And, you know, my, my um, favorite example here are two, two writers, uh, very canonical writers, um, completely different lives. One is Joseph Conrad, uh, who obviously had a really exciting life. He was a sailor. He went around the whole world at the heyday of British imperialism and started writing fiction when he was 40. So when his kind of experiences were over, he kind of retired as a sailor and started writing novels. And he, as you know, he wrote this incredible adventure stories with incredibly delicate psychological undertones. Um, and on the other hand, you have someone like Emily Dickinson, who practically never left her room the whole life, you know, and she wrote this incredibly explosive poems. So there's no kind of a life that is there that you need to lead as a writer. As I said, again, art is where you are. Just look at yourself in a different way. If life takes you somewhere, fine, that's totally okay. But do not try to shape your life to fit art. That is the one advice I give all writers. So what is the second thing? The second thing is, since you know literature is a linguistic art, you need an interesting relationship with language. And here again, an interesting relationship with language is not command in the academic sense or in the business sense. It's not exactly that. Um, you know, even if you even if your language is broken or if you don't know grammar very well, you can still be a wonderful writer. It's not, that's exactly why a lot of people write in their second and third languages and even still create very interesting art. So there are those whole other debates about native language and all. But it's, what I'm trying to say is that art is really a kind of a paradoxical combination of the alien and the familiar, right? I mean, you want to read a novel, to watch a film, to read a poem, and to say that, oh my God, I know that feeling. I know that character. That's exactly how, you know, that I know a kind of a gossipy neighbor who's just like that. I know a kind of a mean person who is, you know, just like that. Or, and at the same time, you want the exact opposite. You want to be shocked. You want to be kind of chilled. Like, oh, this is so different. So a good art satisfies both these needs at the same time to to create the familiar and also create the shock. And this is the you know, lovely paradox of art and this is the lovely paradox of language. So language, you know, um, you know, and art must be that kind of this paradoxical thing. I mean, again, to give an example, some writing is closer to the alien, like some of you might like to write speculative fiction, science fiction, you know, and there, um, you know, um, the fantastical element might be stronger. And some of you might like to write stuff set in, you know, in your kitchen or your living room and the familiar element might be stronger, but all writing must have both. All writing must have familiar. Even science fiction is about human motivation and even writing set in the most intimate, private, familiar space must have a touch of the alien. And that is what you, want to capture. So, you know, so I, I again tell my students that the, the reaction you want in a reader after finishing a story is like this. First, they must respond, oh my God, I didn't see that coming. And then, but then it makes complete sense. You want this twofold reaction. You don't want them to say that, oh my God, where did that come from? That didn't make any sense at all. Um, you also don't want them to see that, oh, yes, I saw that, I could see it. So you don't want them either to be completely shocked or you don't want them to be completely able to predict it. You want both. You want both at the same time. So that paradox, you know, is what is creates good writing, that the alien and the familiar. I'll just give a small example for a, from a wonderful um, 
collection of stories I read last year, which came out. It's called The House Next to Your Factory by Sonal Kohli. It's a collection of short stories uh, set in Delhi. Um, and there's this one story about this uh, guy. It's right after 1984, uh, the, the riots, the Sikh riots um, in Delhi, um, uh, after Indira Gandhi was shot. And there's this guy um, riding a scooter, and he sees this patch of kerosene oil grease. And he was very distracted. And he just his scooter just topples over and he falls and he has an accident. Not a fatal accident, he has his leg, his brain. And this is a really interesting example of what I'm trying to say. So you know something fairly ordinary has happened. He just scooter felt it's a disruption by the patch of oil. But at the same time, you know behind it is the shadow of a violent riot. So what I liked was the writer avoided the intensity of the traumatic grandeur of the riot. But the shadow of the riot created something familiar and, and sort of so there are many such examples, you know, uh, Chekhov famously said told the uh, somebody asked him that how do you write your stories and he said that, you know, put your cigarette on the ashtray and I'll write a story about it and it's a, it might be a joke, it might be apocryphal but that's something about modernity is about very familiar, it's about the banal, the ordinary, and yet there's something shocking about it. So the question is, how does literature do it? You know, how does literature, uh, why is literature unique? You know, in what way does it do? I mean, a lot of things capture human phenomena, political science, social science, how is literature unique? And there, there's a wonderful story again in Aesop's Fables, you know, the, one of the early stories I like to say is the early stories about the orator Demodus is one of the Greek orators in the Athenian city state. And, um, you know, he's trying to address a, a kind of an audience of Greek citizens, and they're not really paying any attention. They're extremely noisy. They're completely distracted. You know, they're not. Uh, and he's trying to say something of political importance, you know, some because Athenian city said the oratory was very important. Democracy was essentially performed in that platform. And then suddenly he starts saying, let me tell you a story. Immediately, there's pin drop silence. Everybody wants to hear a story. And then he starts telling the story. The story is about, um, you know, it's about uh, um, a fish, um, a bird, and goddess Demeter um, is taking a walk. And they come to a river. And when they come to a river, uh, the fish swims into the river, and uh, the bird flies off, and then Demeter just stops. And the audience is like breathless. Like, what happened to the goddess? What does she do? And then Demeter says, oh, she's very angry at you for preferring stories over politics. <laughs> so this, you know, kind of opening story of Aesop's fables is kind of an anti-narrative that, oh, you, you guys are trivial, you're fr frivolous. I was trying to address you on a political matter. You didn't pay attention. The moment I start telling a story, you get interested. Now, why is that? What is interesting about a story? Um, you know, what is interesting about a story it's not just a question of suspense. I'll come to that in a minute, that people think suspense is very important. What is interesting about a story is that it's about some something unique. It is about, a literature is always about the particular, a particular person, a particular character, a particular moment. You know, the, the difference between history and fiction is not that history is real and fiction is made up because often fiction is also real, you know. And history also draws on imaginative material. But the real difference is history has a commitment to the public, to a community, to a larger community. You know, it must tell the story of a social group. It can, when it and when it does tell story of an individual, usually it's individuals of public importance, like kings, leaders. So they are important not as individuals, but as a public persona. Literature and film and music, all of that is about the particular. It's about a certain moment. So if you're writing a historical novel, you know, about um, Napoleon or whatever, I mean, you'll be people, the interest is not what he did in terms of his foreign policy, but how many times did he brush his teeth? What was his color of his underwear? These kind of personal things. So the personal, the arts are always about the personal. It's about the unique and the particular, right? That is, um, you know, that is actually what is what is really important when it comes to um, when it comes to the arts. The, the pub the private element um and um you know and it's not necessarily about suspense it's ne not necessarily about what happens because if you look at um the kind of sort of famous pre-modern writers like homer 
and uh, Shakespeare and Milton, none of them were really telling stories which the public didn't know. You know, nobody ever went to watch a Shakespeare play um, waiting to know what would happen because they already knew the story. You know, just the way people went to go to watch Ramlila or certain kind of performance of the myths because story is always known. Uh, the reason they went to watch Shakespeare was what Shakespeare would do with language you know, what Shakespeare would do with character. So the particular vision of the writer, okay, even if I know this is about the history of Rome or a British monarch in the past, how will the character speak in this play? You know, that particular. So what is very important is, you know, um, you know, it's, it's about this uniqueness. I mean, again, uh, the example I give is like, you know, think of somebody uh, doing a presentation on, um, you know, a kind of a very statistical presentation on a, how modern urban life and infidelity. So there's a data and a graph and, you know, it has gone up because of certain life conditions. And then someone comes and tells you, do you know who's, who's cheating? Do you know who's sleeping with whom? You know, what is the interest? There's a different kind of an interest. And of course, it's even more interesting if the gossip promises to be about people you know. So there is always an interest in a particular story. People need to know larger patterns, larger structures. That's the job of social sciences. But when it comes to giving a particular vision, a particular moment, a poem, a poem captures a particular moment, a novel will create a particular character, you know, or um, a film will show us certain, you know, cinematic narrative. A song will also capture a particular mood. So this particularity is what the arts create. So that is one very important thing. The other thing is uh, literature is always multi-sensory. You know, in many ways, for instance, if you take academic writing, it very much appeals to your brain. But literary writing, this is where I guess imaginative writing, I'm not a huge fan of the word creative because that has a lot of baggage, which uh, that's a different discussion. But if you talk of even writing, which we call, whether it's fiction, poetry, whatever we call it, uh, it often ap appeals to your entire body. It, it does, just doesn't appeal to your mind. It does something physical. Think of, you know, um, reading a romance novel and feeling a certain tingle or reading a thriller and you see the, your arms and the palms sweating. So there's a certain physicality of that experience. Um, T.S. Eliot actually um, put it really well that a, a, a true poet unites um, the sound of a typewriter, falling in love, um, um, the smell of cooking and reading Spinoza. So the, the, the kind of hearing, touch, um, um, emotional and intellectual, they kind of all come together. And there's no difference between the art, heart and the brain, you know, that it's the same thing. It's a very artificial thing. To, to, in good writing, thinking and feeling happen at the same time. There's no distinction, right? And uh, there's this um, wonderful saying by uh, the poet, uh, A.T. Husman, uh, he says that a good poem is something which, um, you know, makes you uh, uh, sort of makes you makes you cut yourself accidentally while shaving. So it sort of has that physical reaction in you. It, it evokes something physical. And, uh, and the writer Amit Chaudhary writing about this moment calls it a oh, Husman's vaguely life threatening imagery. So there's something life threatening. So in a way, we think of obviously literature as an abstract thing. It's through language, but its effect is always physical. It creates that physicality and a physical and mental. It's physical, mental, emotional all together. Again, Eliot said a poet should not just look into their heart and write, but heart, you know, brain, digestive tract, the entirety of the being. So you know you are in the company of literary writing when it does something to your mind and to your body. It doesn't matter what the genre is, you know, things like whether it's a fiction or a, or a poem or an essay, all of these are secondary technical things. What, what makes it literary is actually the multi-sensory nature of it. So that is something very important that are you able to create? And again, different writers are different. Some writers are very good in creating smell. Some writers are very good in creating sight. Some writers create sound. Some writers, you know, um, you know, make you think, but there's always a multiplicity of, um, of at least a few things. So I, um, you know, and what happens is it's really a form of persuasion. You know, writing is a kind of a seduction. It's because writing always starts with your own self. It starts with the universe. It's about yourself, you know, what you care about. But that's only the point of departure. 
then you move on to becoming somebody else how do you convince somebody else to read it how do you make it intersubjective right um and and again i give an example of when a, a writer starts writing they're often doing therapeutic writing you're writing a journal and that's completely laudable that's often necessary for your mental health but when you're are you ready to make the transition to what i call effective writing writing not for yourself but writing for other people and by other people i mean not just your mother you know you know really strangers and numbers are not important a, a really intricate moem poem might might just move 10 people and a thriller might move 10000 numbers are not the issue but somebody who's not connected to you somebody who's not connected to that experience at all is the person ready to be moved you know examples of this kind of failure is that you know often entering teenage you write this someone writes a love poem falling up or sort of poem of falling in love somebody reads it and they start laughing you know so that's where somehow you know the therapeutic failed to be effective you wrote the poem with a certain emotion in mind but it evoked a different emotion in the reader what you want is to create it's all about simulating and a good writer can create a certain emotion without feeling it oneself this is what political speech writers are doing all the time they can and make people angry without really caring about the issues but that is a skill of a good writer that um you know you um and that's where i think um you know it's very 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 tricky to think of a poet might say oh come and experience this moment with me i'm inviting you a novelist might say um you know come and look at this life of these characters and essays might say come and think with me about this so whatever it's a kind of a inviting into a different world you're entering into somebody else's world and as a writer your job is to hold hands you know a reader has great faith faith in you a reader will go with you wherever you take them whether it's a world of fantasy or whatever but you must hold their hand and you know and again the thing is that a lot of writing starts out as autobiographical is about somebody like you but it's writing is especially fiction is also about being other people can you be somebody else uh, if you're a man can you write like a man uh, write like a woman if you're straight can you write like you if you're queer if you're upper class i mean all these kind of things and kind of cultural appropriation i mean i this was a big challenge for me um in my in my in my in my new novel the middle finger which is about a woman and and also about a poet because i'm a fiction writer to cap imagine poetry is always challenge but that's, that's a challenge writers have to take at a certain point that you must you know think about that the thing is you know and how do you do that you do that through language and if you think about it language is the most artificial art form and i'm using the word artificial in a very neutral sense not in a negative sense at all um what i mean is literature is the only art form which has no sensory content so painting and the visual arts you can see directly you know music you can hear um sculpture you can touch film has multiple sensory functions so literature is the only art form which is just about this arbitrary science on the page completely arbitrary and even within literature you know obviously prose and fiction are the most artificial because poetry still has an oral component when you think of rhyme rhyme ap ap um, appeals to your ears you know plays obviously can be performative but it's really um you know really kind of um prose and fiction which is very artificial um and and that has a lot to do with its rootedness in print you know without print it it couldn't come into being so this whole idea of reading a book in isolation sitting alone and reading it this wasn't possible before we had a certain kind of a middle class and so there are all kinds of reasons behind it but what this means for the writer is that it is also the most implied and therefore interestingly the most full of possibilities what do i mean by that what i mean by that is that even say even if you're writing the most realist prose if you're just writing oh a person came in wearing a red shirt and look to their right i can assure you 20 readers will imagine 20 different kinds of red they'll imagine even the simple gesture of looking to your right in 20 different ways nobody has the same imagination nobody so this act of translating from language to sensory reality is always different for people that's a, that's a, i think that's a cognitive fact um and um 
and imagine therefore when you're talking of more complex things like grief or love um or anxiety how different it might the, even the word blue the word cup all these basic words bring up different association in people's minds right so the moment you move into complex words it's so much different and the moment you move into more symbolic or more experimental writing then it's even more different i'm talking of the most realistic most direct form of writing even then it's always different and and to just to prove that think of the film version of any novel you've read i don't think it has happened in the history of films based on novels that somebody said oh that's exactly how i imagined darcy to be that's exactly i thought how elizabeth you know and darcy spoke and become never happens it just never happens people always watch films and say they might like it they might say oh it's really nice that was a good take or they might hate it that's not the point the point is they always say oh my god that's interesting that was totally different from what i had in mind right um and that's because everybody creates it's like this is the this is what rolla bart talks about writing reader being a writer so the moment you read something you're writing it all over in your mind you're creating a version now it's true that even a film can be metaphoric and there are silences but about the physical facts there's no debate you know you can see a person being physically represented that's there in your eye completely more experimental films can break with that but basically you are given a physical reality so what i'm trying to say is that remember this actually is a great strength because you can write this you can create a line and yet it can always be something different in the in the reader's mind and and just a test to that you just show the same thing to different five three different people you get three different imaginations and but this kind of takes us back to the question of the you know moment of western modernity where fiction becomes a form that obviously as i said it has a certain kind of literacy certain kind of bourgeois reality um what does it mean you know for them to write fiction from a location in india what does it really mean you know is it um really is it sometimes said that oh we are a performative culture our culture is really not about sitting and reading it's about music it's about scriptures it's about so is that true is it possible or is it like with colonialism this art form came here um there's a wonderful um sort of a fictional sketch by james kudzia uh, called the novel in africa where um one character comes and says that oh the novel is not an african art form african people don't like to sit and read they they are performative they are oral um and and this character is uh, treated ironically so we don't have any reason to believe that character simplis simplistically but the point is raised that is it true you know because um in many ways the oral tales and a one very important thing for a fiction writer is to remember how is the old fashion kind of oral tale like whether it is jataka panchatantra you know chaucer's um chaucer's stories or boccaccio's decameron or aesop's fables how are they similar to the modern story and the modern novel and how are they different and one one important difference is of course you know that moment if you read um don quixote um cervantes there's this moment where um you know he is um uh don quixote and in sanko panza is a much more realistic square and don quixote is uh, sort of looks at this windmills and says oh my god those windmills are demons you know they let's attack them and sanko panza is like oh sir those are not demons these are just windmills and don quixote doesn't listen he just runs with his horse and he falls down and it is sometimes said that the moment don quixote falls down the novel is born the novel is born because the older world view where don quixote saw the uh, windmill as demons is belongs to feudal romance that's the world of the feudal aristocrat king arthur you know whatever um lord of the rings the whole kind of medieval fantasy but but in the modern world windmills are windmills because it's the world of capitalism it's a world of industrial production it's a very banal world and th those things don't happen that's when someone like chekhov says that put your cigarette down and i'll write a story about it for writers the important thing is you'll realize the modern short story is much more cinematic you know you look at things in a kind of close way you know i mean i'm talking about the literary tradition i think in the popular tradition the older thing obviously obviously the telescopic view what i call in my creative writing classes the telescopic view where you take a long range in a in a single story you can cover thousand of years that's a oral mythical story but in the modern story 
a whole novel can be about a single day because you're kind of looking at things in that Chekhovian way, looking at it in a kind of sort of intense microscopic way. And the modern writer's Im imagination is often directed in that. They look at micro things. And, and there are a lot of reasons behind it. And that leads to a very interesting discussion about showing and telling. When do you, writing fiction is like working with a telescope and, the, and a microscope at the same time. When do you use a telescope? When do you use a microscope? I mean, I personally am a writer who's very scene driven. I like to walk through scenes. So a lot of my writings are kind of close to moments. But even then, if I'm writing a novel, at some point of time, I have to say that, oh, three months passed or even a week passed. So the moment you're saying this, you're using a telescopic range. And this is a very important skill for a writer to know when to sh use a telescope and to use a microscope. Um, so that's that's actually, you know, very kind of interesting. And um, what, I, what I realized is that when you're sort of talking about Indian reality, but you're talking about this kind of um, modern rational form, like the novel, a writer has to do a lot of negotiation. So that um, essay I shared with you called The Unmade Self um, was a sort of my account of dealing with this because, you know, how does one, one, it's very easy to grow up reading Western literature and sort of have a reality of that. And as Jamaica Kincaid said that, you know, I grew up in the Caribbean, but I described um, eating strawberries and apples, even though uh, they were not part of my experience or snow. And I talked about palm trees and sand beach as exotic, even though they were my reality. This is how colonial literature shapes your mind. So how does one, and we all go through that. And I think if you read the text, you'll know that how I fought with it when I read vernacular literature, when I dealt with vernacular reality, or um, when I was writing a novel like The Firebird, how um, the older form of theater, how because theater is a, form which predates rational modernity by and there's a kind of savage barbaric nature how that changes the novel form and that is a very fundamental realization for me that yes i am working with a western form but the realities i'm talking about are not necessarily contained within this form and this is how it transform that form itself i can use the form but the form gets transformed and i think this is the experience of many many uh, many um post-colonial writers writing, whether in Africa, India, and uh, not just if you're writing in English or French, but also if you're working with modern Western forms like the novel. And that, you know, uh, obviously also taught me the importance of space, because for me as a writer, um, you know, in that novel, the space of theater was very important. The space of city neighborhoods are very important. But I, I'm often asked that, oh, what are the elements that matter to you? And I always say space is very important. and and I'm also drawn to writing that is rooted in space. So I don't know, all of you might be different kinds of writer. And um, obviously somebody who has speculative or science fiction in mind is imagining spaces in a different way. But I think often it helps to imagine where this is happening. It's not just about story, right? So the key elements, you know, and again, in, in, in the class I'm teaching this semester, we are spending a couple of weeks on each of these key, key elements. But I think when it comes to fiction, hands down, the most important element is character. You know, and Virginia Woolf said that very clearly that, you know, she's talking about Mr. Bennett and Mrs. Brown, that imagine that, you know, old woman sitting in the train um, and she's very neat and clean, but it's a neatness born of poverty, the kind of poverty, which even if a, there's a button is stone, she sews it and you can see that she's sewn everything together. And the moment she says it, you're like, you know this character, you just know this person. And once you know the character, nobody can stop your fiction. You are in the company of that character. That is what you need to know. Uh, Aristotle said that a long time back that, you know, character is basically, uh, sorry, plot is basically character. Don't worry about plot. Think of character. Whatever the character does is plot. That is plot. So again, I often tell writers that, you know, don't think that you're going to write a story about something important, like topical story. Oh, I'm going to start, write a story set in the COVID period. I'm going to write a story about terrorism. I'm going to write a story about whatever social media, and then I'm going to create a plot, and then I'm going to put characters. It never happens. Imagine the person, imagine the character, imagine the character first. And the character, you know, as I said, it is always, it is always the private, it is always the unique. And once you know the unique, it's the, the important thing for a story about 
uh, terrorism is not the elaborate plot and how things, but whether the terrorists like like chocolates or something something un unexpected. Fiction is always about putting that unexpected thing, right? Something unreal. And I always tell my students that you know, pain is often more painful when there's a touch of humor in it. You know, you love. It's like it's like those um, it's like those um, you know those movies where you see the serial killer, a violent act of murder is happening and very soft classical music is playing in the background. And you see the, the, the kind of dissonance between the act and the, and the tonality is what creates wonderful effect. It's like if you create show murder and show like real violent military drum bit, that's actually not as effective, but that paradox, that surprise, you know, again, the alien and the familiar, what you expect and what you don't. And that is really important. And from character comes what is, again, I think the most important thing for you to get started in a story, what I call voice. Voice is very important. It's something if you do an MFA in fiction writing or, you know, if you, for instance, come to our MA, you'll hear a lot about this. It's a very technical term. And I mean, we all have a love-hate relationship with technical terms because technical terms should never limit us as writers, but it's good to know the techniques so that you can break them. Um, but voice is, before you start a story, it's very important to know who's telling the story. You know, And that is something we often don't think about. We think, oh, it's important to get the story going, You know, let it happen. But we don't think of who's saying it. And by saying it, it doesn't have to be, a, it can be told by a character in the story. It can be told in the first person, uh, it can be told in what we call a close third person. That is, it is grammatically a third person, but it's actually the consciousness of one of the characters, right? Um, it is um, it is very close to that character. Or it can be what we call an omniscient third person, where the third person is almost like God. It's like a drone. The drone is kind of far away and therefore can come to any character and settle and fly away and go far away. Or from the beginning, if the drone is right next to your head, you know that it's third person, but it's kind of looking at the world through your eyes. So it's very important to know. It's like, you know, when you meet a person who's just kind of chatting with you, uh, it's not just about what they're telling you. You're interested in the way they talk, the way they move their hands, the way they smile, you know, the, the way they intone their voice. I mean, I, I suppose that's happening to you right now as you speak to me, listen to me. I'm, I'm, I'm sure you're interested in the content, but generally when you read, you're not just reading for the content you're reading for the manner in which you know the story is being told and you want to know that do i not do i like to hang out this hang around this person do i need to spend time with this person is it intriguing mind you it doesn't have to be a moral one some of the best narrative voices belong to serial killers and madmen but is it intriguing is it interesting is the voice ironic um angry loving or a mix of all three what is it? So once you know that, it's extremely important. And think of the famous narrative voices in um, in fiction. Obviously, going back to the 19th century, Charles Dickens's famous first-person stories. You know, whether it's David Copperfield or Great Expectations. There's always that kind of first or close third-person narrative voice. Great Gatsby and Conrad stories are told by a narrator. Um, you know, there's that. Um, and then, of course, the great example of the Omniscient third person is Leo Tolstoy. Tolstoy um, is actually always distant from his stories. Joyce talks about um, the writer as God paring his fingernails. That is, the writer is completely detached from everything. And they get close to whichever character is important. So with Ulysses, sometimes when Leopold Bloom is telling the story, the language is choppy, coarse, full of slangs. When Stephen Dedalus, we are close to Stephen Dedalus's point of view, it's much more elevated, very artistic, very intellectual. But the novel on the whole is moving back and forth. And when finally we get to the mind of Molly Bloom, it's very fluid, very experimental, very rule breaking, very, you know, kind of um, kind of one. The last chapter is one long 48 page sentence in you know, a Penelope of Ulysses. So it's the important thing is to know, and all these fictions are important to us, not just because of what happens. They're important to us because who is telling this? You know, how are they talking? Are they panting? Are they rushing? Uh, are they throbbing? You know, we, you want to know the human quality, right? Remember some of the most 
memorable narrators are what are called unreliable narrators. That is a narrator who is either lying or doesn't know what's going on, or there's an inconsistency. And that is always a very powerful strategy for a fiction writer, because you know the narrator is the hand you're holding to enter a fictional world. If the narrator lets you down, it's a powerful sense of betrayal. And the betrayal is actually a great hook, right? And again, you know, um, famous um, unreliable narrators, if you think of Edgar Allan Poe's stories, um, where Telltale Heart is like, oh, or Jack the Ripper. So it's like the stories are being told by these serial killers. And you kind of know in the end that you know, they did the murder, they're denying. And then think of the joke. So that falsification is extremely important. And then there are first person narrators who are very overpowering. They are, their character is all over the place. Like my favorite example is Vladimir Nabokov's Lolita, you know, where it's really no, and it's really hard to pull off. I mean, because a really powerful narrator is wonderful for a few pages, but to sustain it over a novel is very hard. So it's actually very challenging. On the other hand, you have a, a very understated, self-effacing first-person narrator like um, Vivek Shanbag's um, Kannada novella Ghachar Gochar, where the, the narrator is almost sort of in the background, but you realize there's a sort of emasculated, weak narrator, narrative voices has a kind of a trick in it. So think of who's telling the story, whether it is first person, whether it's third person, how much knowledge do you want? For me, for instance, in my last two novels, The Firebird and The Scent of God, I worked with a child narrator or an adolescent narrator. And for me, that has worked very well because a child doesn't understand what is happening. When in childhood is a time when you're hit by powerful experiences, but you can't quite make sense of it. And that is a powerful space of art where an experience moves you, but you can't analyze it. And so, you know, I think um, in the fireboard, it was really the child narrator and watching his mother on stage, you know, is she really dying? Is she really kissing a stranger? He can't tell the difference. And in the center of God, it was a adolescent narrator discovering his own sexuality. Is he attracted to boys? You know, what does it mean? And this ignorance, this ignorance becomes a matter of unreliability you cannot rely on so remember you are under no compulsion to use a narrative voice who actually knows what's going on sometimes the most interesting narrative voices are those people who don't know or know partially they know some things in their contradiction leave the discovery of the contradiction to the reader that is always a delightful and powerful experience for um you know for the reader um, dialogues are very important, you know, when you write fiction and initially I had a lot of difficulty writing dialogues and that is partly to do with, again, the Indian writer who's describing uh, dialogues which are not happening in English and how do you, you know, create dialogues that are not happening in English, how do you report them in English and, you know, you can't just be maybe the kind of English we speak, but it's a different kind of an English. How do you write an English which is communicable and yet has uh, a kind of an shadow of the vernacular so that part of it is but part of it is belongs to as a problem any writer will face because dialogues to be perfectly honest is not the fiction writer skill dialogues are the skill of the playwright dialogues are the playwright's job a, a script writer's job but this is something which i think every fiction writer has to learn again you will not be good at every element of fiction. You will find that you are a cinematic writer or you're a telescopic writer. You tell better or you show better. You, you, you're a writer who describes very well. You're a writer, but you need to at least have some skills in all these. And it's very hard. Again, there are writers who write almost dialogue-free work, but dialogues are a really useful thing because it really shows a character in action. When you show, and dialogues, obviously, if you're talking to two person, you're, it's interactive. And the interaction brings out the kind of two characters at the same time. Because, you know, when you're showing a character, there's no such thing as a character, but there's always a character in action. You know, think of yourself. You are a kind of person at home. You're a kind of person in school. You're a kind of person at work. There's no such thing as just you. That's an abstract idea. So in the same way, a character is always in a situation. So, and a dialogue is a wonderful real situation to bring it out. 
I personally always advise my students to write what you know. This is an advice one will always say. And as a writer, I always need a seed of reality. You know, obviously, I turn that seed into a forest of fiction, but I need to start with that reality. And I think fantasy also needs reality. And I, I personally love this is again my personal preference. I'm not um, a huge reader of fantasy and science fiction. I know that's a very popular genre right now, but I'm personally more drawn to the familiar. I'm personally drawn to things that are, that are around me because I think the familiar is actually the most fantastical. The, they're the most disruptive elements of fantasy in the familiar. And I always say that, you know, for especially a lot of our students are young uh, undergraduates are young people just out of high school. They don't have a lot of li life experiences. And there's the one experience always around you, the family, you know, the Indian family is the stuff of epics, literally and metaphorically. So definitely you should kind of write and write with the telescope and the microscope. Write, you know, this is something poets know better than us fiction writers that writing is also a play between the concrete and the abstract without the concrete there's no experience without that abstract there's no understanding so you need something you need to kind of touch that little absolute little you know mark on the wall or a mole on a person's skin you need to be, get really close but you also need the abstract thought because abstract thought is what helps you process um, the whole thing um and again think of you know whether it's the tale or the story, is it the element of the tale that is dominant in you or is it the modern story? Again, most likely there'll be an interplay of both, but one might be sort of predominant. One might be more powerful than the other. So find yourself. This is why editing is very important. This is why reading is very important. You are a kind of a writer, but do you know what kind of a writer you are? That is what we can help you discover. And finally, you know, um, you know, I, 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 we should move to the program and take some questions. I'd say don't write to become a writer. You know, in a way, this is the kind of caveat because the idea of the writing course, the program, it sounds like a professionalizing thing. You know, it is, you know, it's like an MFA. It's not like an MBA. It is not like that because writing is about loss. It's about sacrifice. You know, it is... Um, it is, it is a lot about failure, a lot about frustration, uh, right? When you have something to say, you know, it's a bit like the difference between culture and civilization that um, med medical technology or, you know, uh, or, or sciences always improve with time, but not every playwright who came after Shakespeare are better. So arts don't get better. And you'll see that in your own life too. As you grow as a writer, there are the scientific aspects which will always get better. Like you'll, you'll have a certain flair with the, your syntax, a certain way you can carve scenes, but there's still a kind of a wild self that you cannot predict. You might write a great work of art and the next one may just not be that good. You cannot scientific make all of that scientific. With that in mind, I, I know you may have questions, but what I'll do is I will kind of move back to the program a little bit and, and talk about, you know, what, what we do and, you know, what are the possibilities. So let me just, um, you know, uh, maybe pull up my screen here. Um, and, um, you know, after all the uh, <laughs> caveat about professionalization, because obviously we are an institution. And as I say, you come in an institution and you take what you need from it. But of course, you, you know, as a writer, keep that wild self. Don't let it interfere with anything. Uh, but come together as a community and let's see what we can do. So there's a, I mean, a lot of this information here is um, on the website. So it's very easy to avail, very easy to find it. But just kind of going through it um, real quick. Um, you know, this is um, a program overview. So what we have is not an MFA like 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 in like in America because the UGC doesn't approve of an MFA. We have an MA. Um, and the MA with a creative writing concentration, which means there are a lot of literature classes you'll be taking. It's not just about, and that I think is a good thing because, you know, really the best thing an institution can give you is to make you read. The writing will happen, but there are creative writing workshops too, and you can write a thesis, which can be um, a collection of short stories or a collection of poems or a novella or a collection of essays, but you take a lot of English courses. So you take a lot of English courses, in, including literary theory courses. So it's very much, uh, it's um, even though the workshops are what we call studio driven, uh, the classes are, uh, there are a lot of academic classes one has to take. Um, so, um, so this is, um, you know, all there and there's research. Um, 
you know, um, it's a two year course, it's four semester program. Um, and, and, and these are the, I think the most unique thing about our MA is that there is this concentration. So these are the six concentrations that we offer. Uh, creative writing is just one of them, as you can see. So there's gender and sexuality studies, uh, South Asian literatures, modern literature and culture, global medieval culture, global and Indian Shakespeare's and creative writing. You just need two courses in any of these fields to declare a concentration. And the expectation is that you will be writing a thesis in your area of concentration. And for that, you need to find an advisor who's willing to advise you and who's an expert in the field. And the best way to do that is to, I always say that, find out about the work of the faculty, You know what the kind of work they're doing, what they're publishing, what they've written, what kind of classes they're doing, because that is what is really helps you to create the advising relationship. Um, so total of credit numbers, these are all technical things, you can find it. So this is a sample semester, you need to take some courses in literary theory, there are electives, there's a research methods and writing course. And then the second year, the thesis becomes really important, you know, as well as you keep taking certain electives. Faculty, uh, again, you can find this on the website. These are the faculty from both English and creative writing. These are two different departments. I am appointed in both English and creative writing because I do creative work as well as uh, critical work, uh, but otherwise it's different department, but it, there's a lot of synergy. Our, all our creative writing um, faculty are also very much write critical work and even the people who do critical work do it in unusual ways. So I think the distinction between the critical and the creative is not something we greatly believe in, as you might have sensed from what I said. So again, you can find the faculty here and then there's some technical details about dates, and fees and financial aid and all of that. Um, but I think what I'll do is I'll stop here now and I'm sure you have questions maybe about the subject of the talk or um, or about the program. So Anuja is here, so I'll let her take over the questions and we'll take it from there. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. That was a wonderful session. I, I really, I'm really sure that the audience really enjoyed it. Uh, so moving on with the questions probably i'll just go ahead with the first one which is there so um okay so someone uh, called devanch is asking whether the essay that you were talking about in your lecture uh, whether that could be sent here or on mail uh, so if those refer to the links which you have already shared professor i can definitely share it with him if this is related to anything else devanch then probably you can just be more elaborate and uh, just share I think the essays that were sent out, right, Anuja? I think this person, Devanch, probably didn't get it or maybe he was a late yeah. registration. Yeah. I think it was already sent to the people who registered earlier. So right. I referred to some of them as a question of creative writing workshops. Sure. Um, okay, so there is another question that how does Ashoka's English department support writing in Indian languages? What is your pedagogy there? So that's a great question. I think we call ourselves, again, there are two departments, English and creative writing. Uh, English is, we call it English, but it's really a department of comparative literature. And we have people doing work in every language, a couple of European languages too, but a lot of Indian languages. We have translation experts. Um, uh, and we actually just set up the Ashoka Center of Translation. Um, so Rita Kothari, for instance, does translations from Gujarati, Arunava Sena in the creative writing department does translations from Bengali. Um, and, and many of us also do work in different languages. Uh, and even those of us who write in English are very much sort of haunted by the vernaculars in every sense, as it were. So uh, that being said, um, you know, as it happens with everything in India, uh, we bring different languages, but we need some common languages. Um, and you know, by default, that common language often ends up being English. I think um, some people, obviously Hindi, for a number of people, Hindi is a common language. Um, but um, but I, I don't know if the final thesis is possible to write it in an Indian language. People do translation work. Creative writing allows translation as a thesis. That is, you translate a work of Hindi or Gujarati or Bengali into English. Um, I think there are even some writers who are more comfortable writing in an Indian language. Uh, I actually had a writer from Kenya who um, 
you know, who wrote in Swahili. Uh, he said he wrote in Swahili, but he also wrote in English. Um, but eventually, the work we see is in English. So there's a kind of a self-translation involved. I think the be this is best answered by the translation experts. But there, there's definitely a lot of support for Indian languages, even though our final language is really English, so that everybody can be on board. Okay, that answers your question. Thank you, Professor. The next question is uh, from Abhik Ganguly. He's saying that he enjoys your columns in the Hindu a lot. And due to cyclical COVID lockdown, storytellers like him are bereft of true experiences. And somehow the stories we tell feel like that they are being dishonest to themselves. Is there any solution to that? That's a great question. And thank you for, you know, I'm glad you enjoy the columns. It's it's interesting. I've actually written something on this very subject. I think right early on when COVID started, it, this was actually for the Hindustan Times. They asked me about, um, you know, something about what is happening to writers. And I think it's very interesting because we are deprived. We can't go out. We can't meet people. So in a way, uh, if writers are kind of in prison, of course, it happens to everybody. It's not just writers. It's selfish of me to say so. But uh, how does that change? And I think one thing I, and I wrote that in that essay, I think it's, um, you can just look it up, I'll find it, um, is that one immediate thing we saw in students is that a kind of hyper dependence on digital media. So that is already true for a generation of students. In any case, a lot of OTT. And you can see that, you know, that, that you can see the sense of that, that is changing. But I think that's obviously a big loss because I tell them and I've Tell, told this to students going to schools that it's great that you've written about this complete fictional speculative reality, but just look outside your window, step outside. You know, there's an epic happening on Indian streets. You know, it is actually, it's kind of sad to deprive yourself of that reality. Um, so, um, so yeah, I think this is, a, I mean, of course, you know, writing is not the only thing. Our entire life has been kind of derailed by this, um, but, uh, I think a writer is never limited. Right? That's why I gave you that example of Emily Dickinson. You know, she really never stepped out of a room. And you may be a very outdoor person and now might be feeling very throttled. But this gives us new realities too. You know, I mean, if those of us who are lucky enough, you know, there for many people, who, th th this pandemic has not been lucky and very kind at all. We've lost lives, health. But if you're lucky enough to be even thinking about reading and writing, I think there are different realities. I mean, think like Chekhov, the cigarette on the ash tree. I'm not asking you to take up smoking, but you know that minute thing. Look at you know maybe formulations about things, sense of distance. So yeah, it's an ongoing thing. There's no easy answer. It's a big problem. But thank you for the question. Yeah. Uh, the next question is uh, about that. If the person is requesting you, if you could say a bit about language and sensibility. For instance, writing a novel in English, but has which has an Indian sensibility. The question about authenticity. Is there anything that you would like to share, Professor? It's really not a reality for me. Again, I've written quite a bit about it. A lot of writers have written about this, you know, um, because um, I think some as early as at 1930s, Raj Rao wrote this in the preface of Kantapura that the challenge is to write in English a life that is not lived in English. And uh, how does one do that and not just that you know sometimes the rhythms of the life are not kind of um workable in the form you're trying to capture like for instance you know Achebe writing uh, things fall apart you'll see the language and Achebe and Gugi Watyango had this big debate about this whether African writers can and should write about English because their reality is very different first of all it's politically a compromised thing this is the language of the colonizers but is it even sustainable and then Achebe says that I can make English sound African I can make English sound so obviously things fall apart is an example where Igbo proverbs are directly translated and you can see metaphors and similes which are not really used in English but they're kind of epic references mythical references and I think Indian writers have done this a lot you know there's a lot of that um, I personally uh, wrote about this in an essay I wrote for Lit Hub about managing Bangla in English uh, growing up and how once I, when I thought I was writing in English, I was only writing about a certain social class of people who spoke in English. And then I realized that, no, I don't have to be limited that way. I can write in English about people who don't live in English and that gulf is actually a strength. 
that gulf is actually a beautiful strength. As I said, writing is always that play between the familiar and the alien. So I can play with that. And there are certain realizations one goes through. This was a big debate for poets in the 60s and 70s. Indian English poets were having this debate. People like Nisim Ezekiel, P. Lal, Arun Kalatkar. For them, it was a big. Arun Kalatkar is a poet who obviously wrote in English and Marathi. His famous expression that I write with a pencil sharpened on both ends. Um, and there are bilingual poets too, obviously, if you think of Ramanujan and you know many poets. Um, so it's a reality. I think it's a strength. And um, as I said, you know, uh, to be able to write well in a language, your relationship with is not the same kind of command that academic classroom requires or business command. It's not like that. And the, probably the most famous example is that of a, um, um, the palm wine drinker. I'm forgetting the name of the writer, the African writer who wrote that book. Um, yeah, I'm just uh, trying to remember. But yeah, he had this person had um, fourth grade education and he wrote in very pigeon broken English. In fact, the title of that novel is The Palm Wine Drinkard as opposed to Drunkard. So again, that had a lot of praise, had a lot of controversy also. But don't be afraid to let your English show the strain of another language. Of course, it should be appropriate enough to communicate. If it breaks down, it should be. But within that range of communication, don't afraid to push its limits. It will only be richer for it. This is how English became a world language. In fact, American English was frowned on and laughed on initially. Then there's Australian English, Caribbean English, and of course, Indian English. And in the hand of Indian creative artists, it takes on many different forms. So thank you. That's a very important question. Yes. Thank you, Professor. So there is another question that why should one go for an MA program in English here over an international master's program offered elsewhere? Like from a career point of view, this person has mentioned. That's, uh, that's obviously entirely a choice. Different universities offer different things. I think our approach is, those of you who know the Ashoka model, it's actually very much like a American classroom. There is no syllabus, there's no curriculum. And the professor teaches whatever they want. We basically have some very general curricular guidelines, like you take a course in theory, and the rest are all electives. So it's very open. And no, no professor is told what they can teach and how they can teach. It's completely open. Uh, most professors are, in fact, encouraged to teach close to their research, what they do, because that is the creates the best pedagogy rather than handing down a syllabus. Um, so in, in many ways, you'd be getting a classroom experience, which is more similar to the American classroom than the British classroom. The British classroom is, I think, a little closer to the current system of public university, you know, that we have, which is more syllabus driven, more exam driven. Even the lectures are similar. Uh, beyond that, of course, if you go for a master of fine arts in the US, uh, you might have more writing and less reading. We hear the right reading is more. There is writing is at the core of it, but we do more reading. Though that's not always the case. One of my thesis students last year is now doing an MFA at Columbia. And she tells me that most of her writing courses are more reading. So they're called writing courses, but they're actually, and of course, nobody ever become a good writer without reading a lot. So it all depends. You know, I think the best thing to do is to research the structure of the courses and most importantly research the people who are teaching it you know i think i would want to be taught by or guided by writers whose work i enjoy or whose work resonates with me you know so find out more and then it's a decision you have to take yourself right um there's a threefold question from someone it's about the master's program so it's about is there an upper limit in terms of age for those applying for the ma program the no, no upper limit not at all the second question is, how important is it to have a background in literature? That's a great question. Um, it's not a requirement, really. It's certainly not a requirement. In fact, we have found that sometimes um, the best um, thinkers about literature uh, and certainly the best thinkers about writing come from other worlds, because I think literature is something which belongs to everybody. And somebody who is doing interesting thinking about sciences or performance or business can certainly bring something to literature. Uh, that being said, I think you need to be a reader. It's very important that you read and read a lot. 
uh, of course it's also important to be a writer okay? so you should be able to and again we don't expect you to be finished writers as you join i mean you will be assessed on certain essays and uh, thing but of course your writing will shape as you are here but without writing um, even if you're doing an academic ma the writing is very important so if you're a reader if you're a writer it doesn't greatly matter if you don't know what are chaucer's dates or when were the romantic poets writing i don't think that kind of knowledge is can easily be fixed but the basic thing is what is more important so definitely of course that being said if you're coming from a discipline closer to literature say history or philosophy you might but it's impossible to say some of the uh, most voracious readers i know are science students you know there are some of the most voracious readers i know are engineers so if you're one of those i think you will probably do better than somebody who waded through a perfunctory ba in english without real interest in it right um the third question is what kind of questions are asked during the entrance test the on the spot essay right um i think uh I think the spot essay is a example of um, um, the kind of things we want to know. I mean, don't worry. We won't be. Uh, one thing we definitely don't do is we don't sort of test you on a body of knowledge. There's no body of knowledge that you need to know. That we don't tell you. Okay, tell us ten important writers from the Romantic period. We're not interested in that kind of questions. That is not important. So don't go on. cramming things in the ugc net style or the gre lit style those are not important but we want to see basically that uh, again the the prompt the kind of essay questions are themselves a kind of a hint we want to know that if you have something interesting and original to say about literature see what is happening is uh, as you move from the ba to the ma and the phd you are slowly moving from being a consumer of knowledge to being a producer of knowledge and this i think is insufficiently stressed in our indian educational system till the masters you're just being tested on what you know we want to find out what you can create can you create new knowledge so if you ask your question and it's a kind of a question which anybody who is a reader who has some facility with language can think can you come up with an original point of course if you are widely read if you know um of course if you you know maybe have some familiarity with the kind of work we do that is an advantage because it's a, also a question of finding a good fit between you and the program are are we are we a good place to do the kind of thing you're doing but it's basically basic literary intelligence it's that's the kind of things we are looking for if you read widely if you enjoy reading if you enjoy thinking about writing you have nothing to worry about you'll be fine um the next question is that this person would like to know more about the admissions process and how like what kind of uh, the process does it seek an ideal student to be and be it the writing samples or the interviews well that's exactly what i just answered in my previous question um i think as i said you need to be widely read you need to be able to write well and yes um you know i think familiarity about our program and our work is always useful because eventually you'll be choosing a supervisor and working with them so i always say you know because we are a research university our teaching is also driven by what we research what we write what we publish so if you know that that is you're always at an advantage that this is what i want to do this is what i want to work with this is what i the kind of classes i need to know because you'll be customizing your own education to a degree a lot of it is electives um that being said i think we are looking for somebody who obviously knows about literature has of course if you have a basic english degree you have that already but maybe is also starting to think of certain angles which interest them more who oh, i'm interested in i don't know victorian coming of age stories i'm interested in something you know um that is useful again not required but somebody who really thinks and talks about writing and um has feel this is a good place for them is what we are looking for and of course write well that is very important to uh, sort of get through the preliminary stage of selection okay uh the next question is something i feel something related to what professor has already shared but if you would like to share anything extra i'm just stating the question that would you advise someone who just finished their ba to join the ma program at ashoka or would you advise them to spend some time outside the academic before applying 
that's a great question. Uh, I know in India it's customary to go from the BA to the MA, and this whole anxiety about losing a losing a year and all that is there. But even in the West, and I taught in America for many years before coming back, it's actually quite normal to take a um, year off, study abroad, or just travel. Of course, it's a you know in a wealthy country things are different, financial concerns are different, and everybody has their own goals and financial concerns. But if you can afford it, I always recommend taking time off. You know, and if your family is okay with that, or sometimes family is you have to fight families about these things. But I think uh, MA is a program where uh, you your success depends not only on how you do in the classes. But on the thesis, and the thesis is something you create yourself. It's 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 really you have an advisor, but you're really shaping it. And even in the classes, are not really exam driven. You'll be writing papers, so much of it is kind of self driven. You know, you'll be kind of customizing and shaping your own educational experience, and that requires a certain maturity. So taking a year off, if you can do it, a year, two years, maybe working is always a good idea. I certainly suggest that. Um, there's this question about the career opportunities which are available after completing masters in English from Ashoka University. Yes, yes. I think we have um, a whole section devoted to it. There are a lot of information available there. I think uh, Anuja can share that later. But lots of options, lots of options. Obviously, as it happens, English sometimes for the wrong reason, sometimes it has a lot of prestige in India, sometimes because of your colonial history. So an, a degree in English opens a, opens a lot of doors. And uh, especially Ashoka, because the kind of education we offer, which is not the same kind of an MA, we are quite driven and quite, you know, kind of focused. Uh, pedagogy is very different. Um, Ashoka students get placed in a wide range of spaces right from the obvious things like we have a lot of ashoka majors working in for instance television you know in bombay in 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 in, in films uh, obviously a lot of them go into print and electronic media but many of them also go into um, other kinds of corporate sectors and also ashoka being quite connected to the ngo and the corporate world those placements are, are quite easy to access because they have a very ac active placement cell internships are something ashoka students do a lot and through internships they get jobs um, of course teaching is always an option teaching in k-12 uh, secondary level or teaching for a while before you find yourself something else and finally there's of course the phd you know for those of us who want to move into different spaces for people who want to really write often they need to find a job in media or some kind of a job teaching while they actually do the writing because writing obviously is not going to support support you um, but there are so many options and and finally because we are in the delhi ncr area which is really the subcontinental hub of media publishing academia i mean not just india but india bangladesh pakistan everything so we are really in a great location for you to connect you with every kind of professional openings that there is. Okay. Uh, thank you, Professor. There is a question that whether a person can take two concentrations or not. Okay, that's ambitious, but uh, I don't see why not. I think that should certainly be doable because um, we have students doing double majors. We have students doing uh, double majors. We have students doing a major and a minor. Uh, we have students doing um, major and a concentration. So if you can do it, that's certainly possible. Um, I just don't know. You can only write one thesis. So I'm not sure how you will write two theses, but it's a conversation we can always have once you're in the program. Uh, the next question is about that whether there are electives offered uh, on ancient or pre-colonial literature or epics. Oh, yes, definitely. We actually very strongly encourage students to think about the past. What we notice is uh, among students in India generally doing literature, there's a kind of a obsessive presentist focus. People are only interested in reading contemporary literature. And of course, we are contemporary critics and writers so we are very much in that but even those of us you know who work in the present we i always encourage people to sort of go back to a medieval time and i, I, I as i said as you've sensed from my talk it's not possible really to understand even the modern short story till you know how it's departing from the oral tale of the past so the past is very important and we actually have a very strong segment of the faculty 
focused on studying the past. We have like Shakespeare and Renaissance studies is a very big strength of our department, English department particularly. Um, medieval, we have a number of people working on medieval European literature, medieval Indian literature. So definitely a lot of interesting work on the past is there. And I, I think this applies even to people who are writing now. I mean, or instance, I think, you know, for most fantasy writers would agree that knowing the medieval age is always good for you to write fantasy. But even for people who are doing academic work in the present, I think I strongly encourage, in fact, one of our requirements is that of the courses you take, at least two must be in literatures before the 1800s. So we definitely encourage that. See, literature is about not just seeing yourself, but seeing otherness. And the two important ways you can see otherness. One is spatially looking at a culture different from you. And the other is temporally. Even if you're in the same space, what was it like? What was Delhi like in the 13th century? And sometimes both. Medieval Europe is distant from you spatially and culturally uh, and temporally as well. And that otherness is very important to inhabit, to be able to understand literature. So thank you for the question. Professor, before we continue, just uh, asking that whether it's, is it fine if we continue to 1230? Uh, sure, sure. We can continue uh, for a bit. Mm. Yeah. Uh, so this this person who would like to know a bit more about the financial aid, which is available to the students who are interested in pursuing the master's program. Mm -hmm. So your take on that? Uh, this is something I think um, the, I mean, probably you all know the technicalities better. But as far as I know, it is need based financial aid. We don't have yes. merit based financial aid. So yes. I think they um, look for um, um, uh, what, what do you think, Anuja? I think it's the. Yes. The, so what I will be doing, uh, Professor, I will be sharing all the relevant links in the chat uh, with regards to the master's program. All the information is very much available there. And with regards to the financial aid, we just need to let you know that at Ashoka, all the programs which are offered are actually offered on the basis of need based financial aid. So you are your selection will be uh, based on the basis of your merit. Uh, but the financial aid which will be offered, it will be done only after, you know, going through your financial documents and doing a thorough check. And on the basis of your affordability, we will be providing you with the financial aid which at times also goes up to 100%. Yeah. Thank you. Um, then there are, okay, so how relevant are LORs, the application for the program for an amateur, what support can a person receive if that person would like to apply for PhD programs post the master's degree? Yeah, of course. I mean, uh, that's what how it goes. I mean, uh, if you have done an MA, you've come to know the faculty well, or at least some faculty well. And uh, of course, we write LORs. We write LORs. I mean, you should ask an LOR from somebody who has come to know you well and whom you know well. Um, ideally, there's a connection between their books and research and what you've done. So that once you have that connection, once you've taken a class with them, maybe, or your advice is certainly will be able to write an LOR. So definitely LORs are um, something we regularly write um, for for students we know well. I mean, again, a student who took a course, um, you know, in a class of 150, that's not going to apply to you. That's undergr undergraduates and barely spoken class. It's much harder to write an LOR. <laughs> but of course, if you had some sort of an engagement in, in class or outside, it's definitely possible. Yes. Sure. Thank you, Professor. The just next question to, is... Add, just, yeah. Sorry, sorry, no, just to add to that, I mean, a lot of the thing about being in a liberal arts university, especially where the teacher-student ratio is so favorable, is that you should really cultivate the faculty more. I mean, it's not just about the classroom, you know, reach out, you know, reach out to them, talk to them. Uh, and very importantly, read up what they've written, what they're doing, because they are, as I said, in the research university, the main intervention they do is through what they write, what they publish. Once you know, and then through that, you form your research relationships. And um, that is often the most important educational space. It's not just the classroom. The classroom is still a thing. And our, our classrooms, I think, are very exciting spaces. Our pedagogy is very different. But that being said, that's the general education. The specialized education often happens outside the classroom through this kind of reading, through this kind of exchange, through this kind of meeting. So always make use of that okay? once you're here. <clears throat> there is a question about how uh, the relevance of the master's program at Ashoka if a person is coming from a different discipline such as law. 
Um, so how does that act? Shape? Right. Um, I don't know a lot about law per se. I mean, obviously it's a professional discipline. Uh, political science, for instance, which is a liberal discipline allied to law. Um, but as I said, we are open to all disciplines. We do not require a bachelor's degree in any subject. It's not a requirement. Uh, some of our PhD students have come from engineering schools and they have done very well. They typically have some catching up to do because you know, for a PhD, you need a certain body of knowledge. You need a certain canon. Uh, that's less for the MA. Uh, and so you need to sort of spend time doing that, but you can do it on your own. You don't really need need to have done it before. What we are really looking for is that spark, that spark of creativity, that spark of, you know, sort of sense of reading, that sense of that world. I mean, things which are hard to define, but the definable things are reading and writing skills, which will be assessed in the admission, in the reading your application, in the interview, so we'll, we'll look into that. But again, no formal background is not the defining thing here. Um, there's a question. Well, about... we, have, we have faculty doing research on law and literature. In fact, we also have one professor who has a law degree and an English PhD. So obviously, all these fields also create opportunities for interdisciplinary research if you want to do that. Um, there's a question about the concentrations, whether it's mandatory to take it up for the program or not. No, that's a very good question. You can also do a general MA. You can also do an MA without a concentration. That would be a general interest MA. Uh, but you're still expected to write a thesis. So you have to just find an advisor and decide what kind of thesis you want to write. But you are not required to do a concentration. It's optional. Yes. Um, there are a few questions related to the webinars which are lined up. So I would generally suggest all of you who are interested in the upcoming webinars uh, or just follow us on the Instagram channel. The Ashoka University handle is very much there and it's very active. We will keep you updated about the upcoming webinars there. I hope that answers your question. Um, then... Okay, there's a question again about concentration that if that person uh, like considering uh, how can I decide what concentrations I should do when I feel like I want to do all of them. <laughs> That's great. I'm so happy to hear that. Um, as I said, you know, it's not really a big deal because the concentration just requires you take two courses uh, in that field, you know, and there will be courses, but you in reality, you'll be taking how many? Two, two, two. Uh, I'm forgetting the num exact number. I think you're taking at least eight or ten electives, so you will be doing multiple concentrations um, anyway. It's just that your transcript will show a certain concentration, but but that is not the only thing. Your transcript will also show the courses you've taken, so it will also have a record of all the different things you've done. And as we know, the most important part of you know literary education is not the transcript, but your internal. Um, and so definitely that is, um, you can take courses, um, you know, any, you can even take up to two courses outside the department. So if there's a sociology course or a, you know, if even a physics course you want to take, you can do but the maximum of two, uh, the rest must be from the English graduate offering. So absolutely. I mean, this is what we, this is exactly the attitude we want. Go nuts, take as many courses as you can. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, maybe one last question um, that well, uh, can you tell us a bit about teaching assistantship at Ashoka for the master's students? Yeah, so traditionally, um, we don't have teaching assistantships for the master's students because we uh, have two kinds of teaching um, positions available. One is the for the undergraduate students, the fourth year. Uh, who are the Ashoka Scholars Program, who um, are also be overlapping with you because some of you will come with a three-year B and they'll be in your class with the ASP. Uh, so they do work as TAs. If they're writing a thesis, they help us with our classes, but they don't get paid. They get credits. So it appears as a class on their transcript, teaching practicum. And then we have teaching fellowships, which involve more work where they lead discussion sections, and where the great papers, those are paid positions. So those typically we hire from outside people with a bachelor's degree. 
um, at least with a bachelor's degree or a master's degree, often we get PhD students doing these things from Delhi University, JNU, anywhere students come from all over. And finally, our PhD students who are given a funding for all five years, they get a stipend for five years, a living stipend, housing allowance. They are required to do some teaching as part of their um, PhD. They even do independent teaching. They do after, I think it's their second year, at the end of their second, the third year after the comprehensive exams, they independently teach some introductory level classes and they also help us teach. The MA students haven't typically been integrated because they are not paid and we don't have any space for teaching practicum credits. But I think last year we finally opened this up because we found some courses uh, that were very relevant to MS students. And if you do that, again, um, these, these teaching assistantship positions are not paid positions, but it counts as a course for you. So you get a teaching practicum and you get credit for that course. So that that is possible, yes. So professor, there's actually quite a few questions which is not related to the master's program, but I'm like because of the paucity of time, I'm not being able to address all those. So I would like to apologize to the audience members who are probably taking it to their heart that I'm not being able to ask all the questions. I hope all of you understand that there is a paucity of time and it is a hybrid session of a master class and a master's information session. Uh, but Professor, I hope I really hope that there will be another session with you where the audience would be able to get all their questions answered. There's quite a few questions otherwise lined up. Um, so I, I, can see, I can see that uh, for questions about um, um, uh, questions about writing. I mean, again, if you um, uh, if you go, I, I have I have I have written quite a bit on creative writing and, you know, sort of thinking about the writing process, writing workshops. There are a lot of those that are written and there are many of them are archived on my website. You can go and check them out. And I obviously regularly write on these questions, but um, this is a kind of a new field, which I think there's been a lot of research and thought in the West, but in, the, but in India, we are among the first who are trying to sort of bring it into focus. And, um, and it has also a lot of challenges because, you know, it's, India is not the same as a Western location, yet in some ways the models work. It's very much like the liberal arts experimentation we are doing here. And there are challenges too, as I said, in, I've written about how as an Indian writer you negotiate with these things. Um, but it's a very exciting field and I think there'll be a lot of opportunities in the future for those of you teaching India being a country with a bulging youth population, there'll be a huge demand for people who can teach these fields. So I don't think any of you should worry about job prospects. That is going to be a very vibrant field. I sometimes worry about the way, um, I don't think the government's approach is quite right in when it comes to higher education, but I think there's a lot of options. And I think in some senses, the Anglo-American West has seen a bit of a decline. I think in Asia, there's a boom. So I think it will be quite exciting. So thank you very much for joining us. And hopefully some of you will continue the conversation with us either formally in an institution or informally and there on email. And um, we can always catch up. I'm on social media. So feel free to reach out to me in any way that is comfortable. OK, over to you, Anuja. Enjoyed the session. I really hope. Um, am, am I audible, or is there a certain lag? I think you're fine now. You were. You, oh, we look okay. for now. Yeah. You're. I really hope that we uh, get another opportunity to interact with you in an upcoming session. Uh, so thank you, thank you, Professor, and thank you everyone who have joined us. If there is any specific question that you would want me to convey to the professor, please feel free to write to me. In the meanwhile, I'll just share the link. Uh, related to the master's in pro master's in English program at Ashoka University with all of you here. Um, refer to this link with respect to any doubt that you may have about the program. Otherwise, just feel free to reach out to me. I'm just dropping my email ID here. Um, yeah. Thank you, everyone. Yeah. Okay, thanks a lot. And hopefully I'll see some of you later on.